Okay, our next speaker uh, needs no uh, real introduction, Dr. Berman from Cedars. Uh, as you all know, Dr. Berman is probably, well, he is one of the fathers of both nuclear cardiology and CT and has contributed tremendously to both fields over the year. And I can tell you personally, he's been a tremendous role model to me over the, over the many years that, that I've known him. And so it's a great pleasure to have him here today. And um, he will be talking about functional versus anatomic assessment of coronary disease comparative value, when should we use CT angiography as first line from a nuclear cardiologist? Here we go. John, thank you very much for that, uh, uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, you have over all these years been a tremendous role model for me. Uh, so thank you for the compliment, but you are terrific. Uh, so I'd like to talk about when CT should be the test of choice and also put into some perspective the use of all of these tests across the spectrum of presentations of coronary artery disease. Now the question if we're thinking about value is not only does the test predict risk, but does a test result in improved outcomes or reduced costs? That's the essential metric that we're going to be measured by going forward. So the concept is that value is quality over cost, and quality in our cardiac terms is improvement in cardiac outcomes, and costs are all the costs related to an episode of care. In the new world, we are only the tests and procedures that add value are going to be purchased by third-party carriers. I'd like to cover then across the spectrum of the way patients present to us for coronary artery disease. We've just heard from Dr. Varani an uh, elegant discussion on, in the area of prevention. And consider a patient that was one of our first that I studied. I got into CT uh, in the uh, late 90s. Uh, and uh, this is a 72-year-old asymptomatic physician. When we just started up CT, we invited our physicians to come in uh, to get a calcium scan. His LDL was moderately elevated. Uh, he had a normal exercise thallium scan uh, before we talked to him about calcium. His exercise duration, 10 minutes, and non-ischemic clinical and ECG responses. So we asked him, what did you do after your thallium scan? He said, I didn't do anything differently. I, it, was, it was normal. What should I do? So we offered him the calcium scan, and he came in, and his calcium score was almost 3,000. And we know now that anything over one has an increased risk. What did he do after he had that calcium scan? He started a statin and aspirin. He changed his diet. He lost 15 pounds. He increased his exercise program. And here we are, 2017, never had a coronary angiogram and is alive and well. So calcium, as we just heard, is a marker of coronary atherosclerosis, and it reflects the burden of atherosclerosis in a single uh, in, uh, score. It, re it is the integrated lifetime effect in an individual patient of all of the factors that are producing atherosclerosis. It overcomes the limitations of the global risk score, and there's consistent evidence about incremental prognostic value. This is early data, 25,000 patients, though, from Matt Budoff, uh, in which we see uh, that for any level of coronary artery calcification, including that 1 to 10 group, there's an increase in long-term mortality. And if you have a score of over 100, there is approximately a tenfold increase in mortality based on calcium alone. In the study that was uh, just mentioned by Dr. Varani, the only test that increased uh, the value, uh, the ac accuracy for prediction of events over the, the Framingham risk score was the coronary artery calcium score. And there are consistent uh, findings in multiple population studies to date. And it, Importantly, as just mentioned, it reclassifies about half of candidates who would be eligible for statins into not needing statins with a calcium score of zero. Calcium leads to changes in treatment and in lifestyle. More targeted prevention of pre preventive treatment, upscaling or downscaling, improvement in risk factors has been shown uh, in risk factor uh, in a scan group versus non-scan group, 
uh, intensification of therapy, when there's an a, a increased score, better adherence to therapy, a big problem in tr statin therapy, dietary modifications and increased exercise. So summarizing, in the prevention arena, coronary artery calcium is effective. Stress imaging uh, or coronary CTA play no primary role but a secondary role uh, in patients with higher risk with either, uh, um, de uh, depending on their calcium score, of CT or stress imaging becomes relevant. So I think looking at value, we will see an improvement in outcomes with no change in costs. There's an increased cost of the test, but a decreased cost of, of downscaling uh, uh, therapy in patients with zero uh, calcium scores. And I think it's going to prove valuable. It's true that carotid intimal medial thickness with plaque imaging could also uh, have a, uh, has a potential to do the same thing. In the area of acute coronary syndromes, this is where CT shines. It's got the highest sensitivity and specificity of any non-invasive technique, uh, over 90% on a per patient, per vessel, and per segment basis. And when we care, consider uh, what its predictive value is, uh, it has a very high negative predictive value for events. And importantly, in patients with chest pain, it's very unlikely to miss high-risk disease. That is, you'll hear later, if you go to Dr. Mamarian's sessions, uh, that could occur with diffuse balance reduction in flow using uh, nuclear methods. If you look in the acute coronary syndrome cases uh, situation, there have been multiple randomized trials that have been shown that have shown the benefit of coronary calcium sc uh, scanning, and these in, uh, here's the Romicat two study, where what's illustrated is CT in blue and standard of care in red. We see there's a two thirds reduction in the length of stay in the cal CTA arm, and a two-thirds uh, increase in the patients, a threefold increase in the proportion of patients who could be discharged immediately uh, from the emergency room. As I mentioned, multiple studies, randomized trials, have shown this benefit. So I think what's going to happen with CT, we won't have any change in, uh, in hard outcomes because, in fact, we are very good with our observational assessment of patients over a longer period of time in the ED. But the costs will go down with this uh, use of imaging, uh, and, the, uh, and that's particularly CTA. And I think that the value has already been shown. Our broader patient population is the patients, where, uh, uh, the patients with chest pain who come into the office with a suspected ischemic heart disease. And here's where stress imaging uh, with any of the modalities that we've talked about can uh, be useful and is currently uh, by far the most widely used uh, uh, approach. But CT is increasingly being recognized as potentially an advantageous uh, it, uh, initial test. And that's based on multiple lines of evidence. One is the prognostic data. With every increase in the, in the, in the uh, anatomic risk seen by CT, there is an increase in mortality over time. This is from the confirmed registry in uh, almost 24,000 patients. Now, this has also been studied in multiple large series and with consistent findings of any, cal any abnormality on CT, non-obstructive disease included, there is a significant increase in risk. And what's highly important is what we call the warranty period. If your CT is completely normal, then the risk of an event over a long period of time is low. It appears to be that this is going to go out to approximately eight years or so before the patient with a, calcium, with a coronary CTA that's completely normal might need repeat testing. The approach of coronary CTA compared to standard of care has been the subject of multiple randomized trials now, two large ones. One is the PROMISE trial that showed in the United States over 10,000 patients uh, no significant difference in outcomes between stress testing approaches and CT. And this one that's the Scott Hart trial, well performed in a higher risk population than the PROMISE trial. This is 4,000 plus patients studied uh, in Scotland who were randomized for, to a standard of care versus coronary CTA. 
their likelihood of disease was, uh, uh, their obstructive disease finding uh, was, uh, were that 25% uh, of patients had some degree, some degree of abnormality. What happened in the Scott Hart trial uh, is shown on this slide in terms of treatment. There were cancellations of treatment more commonly in the CT arm and new treatments instituted in the, uh, uh, at, uh, as well compared to standard of care. And what's important here is the, these preventive therapies, which might have been instituted with a calcium score alone, are, uh, play a big role in reducing, potentially in reducing events. The fabulous data of this trial came from what's called the landmark analysis. It took about 60 days in Scotland for the treatments to actually be different between the coronary CTA and the uh, standard of care arm. There was a delay in getting a CT scan, a delay in potentially interpretation, getting that information back to the clinician, and then seeing the patient in the office. But after that treatment delay, if we compare the standard of care to the coronary CTA arm, there was a 50% reduction in cardiac, uh, in cardiac death and myocardial infarction. 50% dramatic finding. And this finding has led to a change in the uh, recommended guidelines and the, the NICE guidelines uh, in the National Health Service in Great Britain, where performing CT angiography as the initial test has become the preferred recommended approach. We need far more centers being able to do CT well. We need more experts analyzing these studies in order to implement this. Uh, but in fact, uh, it is likely to be something that's going to occur over time. Finally, in California, uh, we've had approval after many years by the major insurers of coronary CTA assessments. But what's surprising is that these approvals have come only in, in centers where the FFRCT is available. There's a concern that CT alone might need to increase coronary angiography and, and necessary revascularizations that could be modulated by the use of uh, fractional flow reserve measurements, the functional measurements. So what about CT in terms of value? If used in the right patients with an intermediate likelihood of disease, I think there is going to be potentially uh, no change or even a decrease in cost, but value is likely to be shown. If we use it in patients who are too high risk, then we're going to see that costs will be uh, increased and value won't be there. The, the problem, what do you do after you see a CT scan? It's easy at the extremes, uh, where we just, uh, in the normal study, assure the patient no need to come back for when you have uh, normal scans for a long time. Uh, at high risk, very high risk patient, we know to go to the cath lab. The problem is that in between there's a problem. On the left, we see it could be an excellent gatekeeper to the cath lab, but in the patients where it's too much calcium, a borderline stenosis, or even a moderate stenosis, uh, uh, the, the CT could be a gateway to the cath lab. So the functional assessments of the FFRCT or coronary uh, CT perfusion may reduce unnecessary catheterization. Now, where does ischemia testing fit in? It's in a higher likelihood of disease population. And what's imp uh, important to note is that this approach could be combined with the calcium scanning uh, to add strength. And actually, the potential of having uh, a, a stress test approach plus calcium versus CT uh, coronary angiography has not been tested in a randomized trial. The problem with the stress testing alone is it only detects ischemia. Subclinical atherosclerosis isn't detected. And we could detect that by adding the calcium scan with hybrid imaging. There are many circumstances where CT is just not useful high calcium scores, uh, renal failure, arrhythmia, mor morbidly obese. These patients can be uh, well stratified using nuclear methods. And particularly, all those patients that can't be evaluated by CT are evaluated nicely by uh, nuclear methods. Years ago, we demonstrated in our registry that there is a, a crossover based on uh, the amount of ischemia uh, between uh, uh, with revascularization shown in yellow and medical therapies shown in red. 
The more ischemia you have, if it's over about 12% ischemia, this is a log hazard ratio for cardiac, cardiac death. The more ischemia you have, the, it, it appears that there's an improvement uh, in outcome using uh, a revascularization. If you don't have ischemia, uh, there is uh, no such improvement. But we don't know that for sure, so a randomized clinical trial based on the 10% ischemia has just been, uh, had final enrollment completed. The patients uh, using the threshold of 10% ischemia are enrolled into a trial. There's a blinded uh, coronary CTA to rule out left main disease. And then they're randomized to go to the cath lab or not go to the cath lab. Uh, six, 5,000 patients in this study have been finished, and in many of these patients, as we've seen in our nuclear core lab, uh, there can be severe ischemia present, uh, even though the patients were randomized. What do I think is likely now with this approach? The, in the right patients with intermediate to high likelihood of disease, uh, there will be an improvement in outcomes and value will be shown. But we have to study the right patients. Over time, we've demonstrated that the frequency of ischemia has gone way down, so that we're now down to less than 10% of our patients having ischemia. And that leads to our studying the wrong patients increase costs. In heart failure and cardiomyopathy, this is not the realm, not area of CT. This is for echo, CMR, and PET. CMR, as we've heard, is an excellent method for looking at all kinds of cardiomyopathies and myocardial viability. And in many patients, the nuclear methods with PET for looking at, uh, at viability or at sarcoidosis uh, and with uh, uh, SPECT imaging with pyrophosphate, looking at amyloidosis being areas that are uh, well assessed by these other techniques and not well assessed by CT. The challenges that remained is that we have to uh, improve outcomes or reduce costs, and that requires selecting the right patients for testing. Diamond Forrester classifications don't estimate risk well enough anymore. If you look at the PROMISE trial where the Diamond Forrester risk was 53%, the actual prevalence of obstructive disease, even using a 50% cutoff, was only 11%. So we are too much studying the wrong patients. Finally, imaging tests alone can't improve outcomes unless they result in improved therapy. So we have to include in our reports something that tells people what to do with the test result. So summarizing the applications providing value are going to dominate. They're going to depend for each modality on the clinical setting in which they're applied. You have to link the findings to a therapeutic change, and evidence is going to be required for these applications. Uh, uh, but, but why even feel helpless about your coronary disease and do all this non-invasive testing? Get it, just get an angio, uh, angioplasty. It's cool, and it's, it's way easier than exercising or in uh, changing your diet. And you get that feeling of doing something. Thank you. <laughs>